So I would like to begin by thanking Professor Kleinberg for encouraging me to revisit a series of almost 20 year old studies. For indeed, as you are going to, to understand, I needed a lot of persuasion to return to it. So uh, this lecture will be a very personal one and I hope I will offend no one with such a display of subjective feelings and the history of my involvement with the matters at stake. And the reason for this is just that I've always tried to combine clinical insights, uh, which are highly subjective in their own right in psychoanalysis, explorations in the margins of the standard history of psychiatry, and I fear a bit too bold psych uh, philosophical generalizations. So the best I can do is to provide a frank exposition of the vicissitudes of my research and the reasons of my retractions as well, perfectly aware that I am that's more, uh, that I'm more exhibiting vexing paradoxes and oddities than uh, solving anything. But to start with, if my research on transsexualism, which is the unthinkable metamorphosis, I think the, the book is being circulated, it's a book in French, I'll tell you why it has never been translated in, in English, uh, marked for me the beginning of an ongoing reflection on personal identity and the self. I now see all these questions in a very, very different light than when this book first appeared, something like 15 uh, years ago. Uh, why? In a different light. Uh, is it because it seems to me that the people I read, I talked to and took care of in my consulting room are now very different from what they were 20 years ago? Not exactly. I think rather that my generation of clinicians observed the uh, emergence of other voices and the slow silencing of those who were already not very vocal and which I will call the classical transsexuals in the 90s. Classical transsexuals were those absolutely persuaded that they were, for the most part, women trapped in men's bodies, asking surgeons and endocrinologists to rectify their condition, which was called nature's mistake. It was an existential type, uh, quite similar to Christine Jorgensen, if you know who this uh, man, who is the first very well-known man turned into a woman in the, in the 50s, the, women of the, the woman of the year in 1953, if I remember. But uh, they were also very rare, very rare. Or maybe something like 10 to 15 people, you could see 10 to 15 people like that in French mental uh, hospitals at that time. But in, at the end, at the, the middle of the 90s, the beginning of the 90s, they were just beginning to be replaced, at least in the public debate, by what was called at that time the transgender people, not the transsexuals, but the transgender. And the beginning also of the queer militants, asking for gender fluidity, and very often not asking at all or only for limited surgery. And with this key fact that uh, when I started my studies about these people, they were, they were mostly MTF, men who wanted to become uh, women, women. And uh, uh, the more, more and more there were uh, uh, women asking to, to be transformed into men. Uh, if these categories, of course, apply uh, to uh, those who do not wish to be assigned to either sex or gender. So the classical TS, those I saw at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, <laughs> have been almost entirely silenced today. But they are still out there. They are still accounting in France for the majority of medically treated cases and we know that because of the follow-up by endocrinologists, uh, because they need uh, massive amounts of hormones to uh, keep their, uh, uh, their looking in the sex they, they, they wish to, to have, especially the men. For women, it's a, it's a big difference. Uh, 
A good example of the situation is the, uh, there was a, a recent uh, revendication uh, of the TG uh, community, that means gender community in France, the right to freeze one sperm before castration in order to still be able to impregnate a future partner, even though the biological father would have become then a woman. It was a very articulate claim by a significant portion of the TG community with echoes in the media and uh, it was discussed in the parliament and so on and so forth. But when the option was effectively offered to operated MTF, many of them in the hospitals, in the consulting rooms, were deeply shocked. And why? Because all their life long they had fought to radically erase their masculine past and they reported to the Ethics Committee, which summoned me, that such a proposal was not only meaningless to them, it was abusive. And it was very striking because when uh, the transgender learned that so many people found that their suggestion was abusive, they were completely stunned. They did not imagine that. Uh, because uh, the, the, the split between the, what I call the classical transsexuals and the transgender movement is is now completely massive in, in, in France. So as you see, not all people in this milieu are either queer nor convinced at all by gender fluidity and the like. And I would say that the self-naturalization of sex change, that nature mistake corrected, is very much alive, though it has no voice. Has no voice. The, the, the voice is now entirely in the hands of the transgens of the trans TG community and queer activists. So, uh, uh, a few words. First, on this thick book and on the intellectual and political context of the TS questions in France at that time, that is, beginning of the, the 90s. As I told you, my research was mainly based on classical TS, and at that time, nobody would have expected in France that these classical transsexuals would be a vanishing species, and that they would be replaced by a completely different relation to the body, the sex, the uh, feminism, political activism, and so on and so forth. Nobody. And most French psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, I dare to say, learned about the emerging trends of transgenderism and the queer activist movements by reading me. I gave the first extensive translations and commentaries in French of people like Donna Haraway and many others soon to become luminaries and prominent figures of the uh, queer activism. And I was much derided for this at that time by my colleagues. They were totally blind to the depth and significance of these new social ideas about the self, sex and gender, and the body. But actually, it goes, in France, hand in hand, with uh, a constant misconstrual of American ideals by French intellectuals who hardly see the point with the institution of the self in the United States and view it through the distorting lens of our French notion of the individual moi or, uh, or ego. They had, for example, my colleagues, especially the psychiatrists, absolutely no idea of who her, Harold Garfinkel and Agnès were and why it mattered so much to ethnomethodology, this issue of sex change. And my historical sketch of transsexualism since the 1910s to the 1990s in law, in medicine, in the history of surgery, in the history of endocrinology, in the history of the intersex, for example, but also in social science and literature with so many life accounts by so many different people with hundreds of bibliographical entries came as a complete surprise to, to them. I remember a review in which the writer thought I had never seen any transsexual and that I was not a clinician for obviously people could not be like that. In my professional milieu, the history of philosophy of science and the philosophy of mind, reading this material through a Wittgensteinian prism as concrete cases of private language and first-person paradoxes 
was seen as best as a fanciful conceptual tour de force, but devoid of any relevance, if not of substance. Now, the book's reception by the tiny fringe of French TG and queer militants who read it was no better. The French equivalent of the word transphobic was first coined for me. And I narrowly escaped physical threats. For my work was at that time deeply Lacanian, that is close to satanic, and openly skeptical about anything like uh, freedom to choose one sex or gender. In 2010, at a meeting in Paris, which I heavily contributed to organize, with intersex and TG groups about the ICM-11 than in the writing, even though my views had much more evolved, and i soon tell you how, my, mo my near presence was most unwelcome. And I sadly note that when, as a reviewer, I was, I'm asked to assess papers on related topics, la métamorphose impensable is almost never mentioned. Uh, but people just come to my place because I have uh, files about so, so many papers of anti-technology of the 50s. And so so and they ask me for the documents, and they never quote me in the papers. To sum up on the book, I regard the 10 to 12 years I devoted to transsexualism and the issue of personal identity as an absolute disaster. It irretrievably shattered my academic career. It isolated me from my fellow psychoanalysts, and it still awakes very painful memories in me. So once again, thank you, <laughs> Professor Kleinberg, for bringing me back to the topic, though I truly wonder how on earth you even heard of my work on it. Let me now recall some aspects of the intellectual and political context in France regarding the issue of transsexualism at the time I was first engaged in it. In 1992, France was censured by the European Court of Human Rights because it denied, it refused to record any change in the civil status from male to female, in most cases, of transsexuals who had undergone surgery. Indeed, under French law, you could not freely use your body as a thing you possess. For example, it is still forbidden in France to sell your blood, your sperm, your organs, and things like that. You, you cannot sell them. The European Court of Human Rights, on the other hand, held that an individual who feels ill at ease with his or her sex or gender has every right to bring it into line with his or her intimate conviction, and that all this falls within the scope of his or her agency, right to privacy and self-ownership. This decision caused a considerable upheaval, not only in French law, the law had, had to be changed in France, it had to be um, deeply modified. It was really not easy to, to find how to modify the law in order to allow people to, uh, uh, to change their civil status, because it's not something you, you, you're supposed to do to own or to be able to modify in French law. But also it a considerable upheaval in the dominating medical conception and treatment of transsexuals. For in France, in fact, a vast majority of psychiatrists consider that such a ruling amounted to the legal backing of a blatant delusion of self-identity. And I suspect this is the relevant point for you, Samuel. For transsexualism crudely exposes that a sort of grammatical or a priori about personal identity, self and the body, a grammatical way or a grammatical a priori embedded in ordinary language may sometimes reflect social, political and legal conceptions which can become the target of a form of radical critique. Why do I use this odd expression of grammatical a uh, prior art, it's because I'm here referring to Wittgenstein and especially to the very famous passages from On Certainty, the paragraph 79, 80 and 81, which I'm going to read. 79, that I am a man and not a woman can be verified 
But if I were to say I was a woman and then tried to explain the error by saying I hadn't checked the statement, a better translation is I had not properly examined myself, the explanation would not be accepted. Paragraph 80, the truth of my statements is the test of my understanding of these statements. And paragraph 81, that is to say, if I make certain false statements, it becomes uncertain whether I understand them. So the idea that it was a kind of self-delusion about identity is not exactly rooted in a sort of psychiatric framing of the question. It looks like when somebody who has a male body just says, you are mistaken, and I know that I am a woman within, there is something odd. There is something in which it's not only that you cannot understand properly what he means, but you can be uncertain whether he or she, he or she, understands what he or she means himself or herself. That's the, the core issue. There are a certain number of things. Do I have, are these hands my hands? Ask Wiesgenstein. If you raise the issue, you can ask to somebody who says, is that hand my hand? You can raise the issue of whether he understands what he is really meaning when he asks the question. It's just not like, did I forget my key in my room or did I leave them in, in my car, for example? It's just not the same kind of, of question. So is it not striking that being a man or a woman is precisely not something I can verify? You can verify it, but can I verify it in some sense? That is not something I can be in doubt about. What does it mean to be in doubt about your own sex? You can, and I can't, not out of a material impossibility, but because it is meaningless, verify which sex I am. And Wittgenstein even turns this into a paradigmatic instance of certainty, of what we do not check. Another instance, as I told you at the beginning of uncertainty, is if I start doubting that these hands are my hands, do I understand what it is to have a body and to have hands? to be me. Do I understand what it is? So, hence, the hence this, uh, the truth of my statements is the test of my understanding of these statements. And that if I make certain false statements, it becomes uncertain whether I understand them. Under a plausible reading, this forms the basis for treating people who would check whether they are men or women, as a source of puzzlement. We cannot be sure to understand what they actually do when checking this, and even if themselves they understand in which sense there might be an error, for example, an error of nature, or also an error because other people misunderstand their true identity. Hence, the word, the word delusion. It is not delusion in the technical psychiatric sense. Psychiatric knowledge rather comes afterwards and only to solidify or to naturalize a felt discrepancy which disrupts ordinary language games. And in this context, or so was my impression at the time, psychoanalysis and psychiatry was much more called upon to locate this obviously delusional behavior within a coherent psychopathological framework than imposed upon the clinical material to frame it into a pattern of a deviancy or non-existent uh, deviancy. But before I proceed, uh, a caveat. It is quite common to ascribe it to the well-known psycho psychoanalytic bias of French psychiatrists at the time. You can feel secure, it's over now, it's completely over. 
If this is to be taken as a major factor, I doubt it very much. As I showed out extensively in my book, at that time, transsexualism in France offered a very different face from the one we have become accustomed to since the 90s, and which is best epitomized by the transition from transsexualism to transgenderism, and then to the cultural blossoming of queer identities and flux. As explained before, the standard case, those I met at that time, not my patients today, but those I met at that time. The standard case was a man in his mid-40s, unequivocally convinced that he was a woman inside, and asking for recognition of the self-perceived clear-cut identity, but just as well, quite commonly feeling female organs hidden somewhere inside his belly, dressing and behaving like a stereotypical woman with a great fear and disgust of the slightest sexual ambiguity, who was also quite prone to a rapid succession of depressive mood and paranoid reactions, and confronting the psychiatrist, the surgeon, and the endocrinologist with a more or less explicit blackmail, either he would have surgery and take hormones, or he would commit suicide. Those I met at that time, I was a young psychologist, and I was not in charge of treating them, are now all dead. All dead. Either they committed suicide, or they were, the, they were so badly treated by the psychiatrist, and uh, badly treated by the endocrinologist and so on and so forth, and they got cancers and, and all kinds of diseases and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, in my view, and I still hold that view, I think the core issue was and remains the Wittgensteinian one. Even though the TS would not present these wor worrisome symptoms beyond the mere claim to belong to the other sex, that claim would still raise the issue of its very understandability, not only for the external observer, but for the concerned person as well. Because one's sex is not, at first glance, the kind of thing you can know, in the sense you can check within whether you are truly a man or truly a woman. In the sense of checking within an intimate experience of your self identity that someone else may be ignorant about. And it is very difficult to figure out what such a checking one, uh, and the surprise, even the pain that the inside and the outside do not match, to figure out what it actually means. And even more, to figure out how the process of becoming gradually aware of such a discrepancy uh, can come to the mind of anyone. It looks like, or so my argument was going at that time, that we are being offered a new language game for self-identity in which I am a man, looks like I feel a man, which resembles in turn to I feel dizzy or cold or happy and so on and so forth. Thus, identity is the feeling of one's identity. But just by putting things like that, it was clear that the two language games of being and feeling did not overlap. I remember a man who consulted me something like 10, to 10 years ago. For 20 years or so, he lived as a transvestite. And he was in his mid-50s and contemplating surgery. He was absolutely certain to be or to feel like a woman. His life so far had gone through a cycle. He was a very successful businessman, a fighter with a very strong work ethics. Then he would start to feel depressed. He would fight that feeling of depression, dressing as a woman, high heels, underwear, undergarments, and so on and so forth. He was married. He had children. 
But in this period of depression, he would then have sex with his wife, dressed as a woman, uh, with undergarments and things like that. And now, the crucial part. During his sexual relations, upon ejaculating, he would feel a dreadful pain as he would die on the spot. Absolutely no pleasure whatsoever, but an excruciating feeling of pain. That horrible sensation once overcome, all his impressions to be a woman had vanished, and he was one against the rough businessman everybody knew. Fed up with what he called his vain, defensive behavior against his inner femininity, he wanted to be operated. This is the reason why I suggested you, you may read the case of the Hungarian physician in Kraft Ebing and Moll's Psycho Psychopathia Sexualis. On, on the, on the. Because in this uh, Princeps case, the first case, which is usually considered as the, the, the first presentation of what became then transsexualism, you can observe the same certainty in this man that his orgasmic sensation were feminine in nature explains that what he feels is not at all a masculine orgasm, it is entirely a feminine orgasm. I raised the Wittgensteinian issue with my patient. How could he know that what he was feeling was something feminine? So I even went to explain to him Wittgenstein's argument about private language, and the impossibility of a private ostensive definition. He was, so to speak, discombobulated. Something like that never had occurred to him. But he was perfectly getting the point. How can you be so sure that something that is, that is absolutely private, that you are the only one to get access to, is what you think it is? Unfortunately, he got the point so well that he rapidly sank in a state of utter melancholy. He was no longer considering surgery, but suicide. The odd cycle which he had described to me appeared then for what it was, his painful way to stay alive, just to stay alive. The certainty to be a woman within was a key wheel in the running mechanism of his condition. Denying him that he could understand or feel himself radically better than other people, that he would know he was a woman, well, denying this to him was truly clueless. I never tried uh, such an explan a Wittgenstein explanation with any of my patients afterwards. But I come back to these philosophical considerations later on. For there were also other cultural and social factors which conquered in the 90s in France to worsen the plight of these patients and to trap them into the psychotic delusional subcategory. Medicine in France, especially psychiatry, was and still remains a deeply paternalistic practice. The patient's views on the, his or her condition had never been regarded as a key component of good care. But the endoc even the endocrinologists, who since the 50s strongly contested the psychiatrist's idea that transsexualism was at its core a self-identity delusion, even them did not and do not prescribe hormones as sex change drugs on the basis of their patient's claim. Not at all. Rather, they first turned transsexualism into the mental sequel of a yet-to-be-discovered endocrine disorder. And then, they ascribed the paranoid undertones of their patient's discourse to a side effect, a mere side effect, of the psychiatrist's denial of their condition. First, they regarded, they thought that if people could ask for surgery, 
it was certainly not a psychological problem. It was because it was the mental consequence of a yet-to-be-discovered endocrine disorder, which has to be naturalized and completely objectified. It's not a way of taking into account people's claim. Okay. It's just interpreted as a consequence in the brain of a yet-to-be-discovered endocrine disorder. So, so this, this wish to change sex is in fact seen as a symptom of an endocological problem? If they, were, they do not say it's a symptom, because if you say it's a symptom, that would be psychiatric vocabulary. And endocrinologists and psychiatrists have always been pitied, pitied against each other in this matter, always, since the beginning. Okay. But on the other hand, when they observe the paranoid undertones of, uh, and the mental disorder, which very often uh, go along uh, uh, the transsexual conditions, they say that these are maybe psychiatric symptoms, but they are not linked to the feeling of being a man or a woman. It's just a reaction to the denial from, on behalf of the psychiatrist, of the objective reality of the condition. So at no point, people's claim, what they want to represent to the others, is taken into account, even on the endocrinologist side. Of course, as of today, endocrinologists were in most cases totally unable to find any biological cue supporting their theory. There is no biological, regular, constant, objective determination of, of uh, transsexualism or, or transgenderism, even less. But nevertheless, nevertheless, they would take the often perfect imitation of the opposite sex role by their patients as a proof that it could not be psychological in any way. For example, two sentences you could really very often hear in discussions with the endocrinologists is, uh, it is too real to be faked, too real to be faked, and only a biological drive can lead people to such things. That may look naive, but it's still something commonly heard in the medical world, and it is obviously incompatible with the standard contemporary vindication that sex and gender change is a matter of claiming and choice, and even that it is under the influence of social factors, not biological ones. Let me mention a situation that is not at all rare nowadays in this respect. Some people, in the middle of their transition process, or even having completed it, experience either that it did not solve their problem, or even that it did more harm than good to them. There are not many, but there are quite many. And so they now wonder how it could have been so easy for them, something I, of course, I, I've never seen in the 90s, it's just very, very recent. They wonder how it could be so easy for them to get hormones and surgery, as if the psychological side of their predicament could only appear in full light after the failure of the standard treatment. And now they complain that psychiatrists they, the psychiatrists they met never truly challenged their sex gender change wish, either because they regarded it as uh, driven by a bi uh, biological drive or rooted in a well-balanced subjective personal decision. It is true that it has been noted long ago by the first sociologists who examined those patients, sex change surgery is not the kind of things one can easily regret, because you just cannot undo the operation. When you have made a transition, uh, going back is just impossible. So there is a biocognitive bias towards finding it. It's absolutely perfect. It works. It solves the problem because you just cannot ask uh, to go uh, uh, to go backward. And it is true that for those people I met 25 years ago, it was either surgery or a very miserable life. But this strong personal investment, this everyday struggle, which was the common plight, was on the other hand something like a, a subjective 
support, helper for in this everyday life. As the procedure tends to be more and more common and easy, things are changing. But it's very odd and difficult to understand and I have no simple explanation for this amazing U-turn of a good number of people who've been operated and who, who complain that they have not been challenged enough. So let me now address what I will call the final collapse of the classical TS in France. It took place in a book, a handbook, which is called the Encyclopédie Médico-Chirurgicale, the Medico-Surgical Encyclopedia, which is still one of the major medical reference and handbook in France, and it's a professional uh, publication, which till the 2000s was made of separate sheets to be kept in a, a ring binder. It's a very huge, uh, huge handbook like that before it was on the internet. One of them had two authors. Usually, all these, all these uh, files, you know, they are on a clinical question. They are written by the best French specialist. It's a great professional honor to be called to write these, uh, these documents. One of them had two authors, which was quite exceptional, and I think it's the only case in France I know, in the, in the EMC, the Encyclopédie Médico-Chirurgicale. Because though sharing the same data and even working on the same patients, they were actually on the same world, they could not agree on the conclusions. And of course, it was the transsexualism file. The root of their dissent was the following fact. As long as there is no regular and independent biological criterion for people who want to change their sex, the condition is self-diagnosed. But the treatment is also self-prescribed. And its results are self-evaluated, for there still is nothing beyond or given independently from the patient's satisfaction or dissatisfaction. Hence, two conclusions. One from the leading psychiatrist in the field, who concluded that as long as the operated and hormone patients stopped to complain and were even happy with the procedure, there was nothing else to worry about. It is the behavioral, the external point of view. But on the very same clinical basis, having interviewed the very same patients, the other, who is also a psychiatrist, but also a psychoanalyst, pointed, it to a logic, pointed, out, pointed to a logical dead end. If the disorder is delusional from the start, if it is a purely private feeling, plus a radically delusional self-mutilating solution, there could be no doubt that the operated patients would be happy. But it still would be self-satisfaction in the course of a delusional disorder. For the self, in you know, all this appears out of reach of any objectivization. Okay. So, the logic of it, makes it, you can read it in two ways. Okay. So you could read it in two ways. The two are perfectly acceptable on a logical basis. It's a deluded self-diagnosis, deluded satisfaction. Or, why care? These people were suffering. They do not suffer anymore. Why care if we just operate people and end uh, and, uh, and of, uh, of the problem? This is the reason why when I wrote The Metamorphose Impensable, I started with the case of the Hungarian physician. For in my view, the case extends far beyond this logical circularity of the self-attribution of a disorder of or within the self. It points towards the grammar of the self and the social categories put to use to determine how we speak of ourselves, of our self-consciousness, of the ownership of our body. For in the Hungarian physician's case, there are clearly two phases. When he first wrote to Krafft Ebing, 
he describes his condition as a condition of a man with a woman's soul. A man with a woman's soul. And this is why he feels the feminine quality of his orgasm. And that, this formula, a man with a woman's souls, souls, smoothly aligns with the contemporary views about homosexuality thought of in terms of contrarosexual empfindungen, inverted sexual feeling. But when he goes on writing to Moll, who had replaced Kraft Ebbing at his death and taken over the project of the Psychopathia Sexualis, he tells us a very different story. He has, he read at that time, he had read at that time extensively about the discovery of hormones by Steinar in 1914, around 1914. And now he describes himself as a woman trapped in a man's body. Because the body could become now, and no longer the soul, the target of a medical intervention. Of course, how do you objectively or medically discriminate a man with a woman's soul from a woman trapped in a man's body? Does it feel any different. So you see the extent of the grammar of the body, the self, the gender, the sex, etc. There are still people who regard themselves as men with women's soul. There have been, I mentioned a few ones, and usually they do not look for surgical solutions, but for spiritual solace. Just like the physician, the Hungarian physician in the first part of his life. You know, they're just looking for something for the soul, not for them. But you see, we depend on the delineation of what belongs to the body, to the soul, to the articulation, and to these bizarre structures of man with a woman's soul, man trapped in a woman's body, and so on and so forth. We depend on this. My leading hypothesis was that issues of that sort, logical and grammatical ones, and not empirical ones, were the red thread of the history of the problem, down to contemporary issues about sex and gender. And that's the reason why I had so many friends in the uh, uh, gender study communities, because I just have that it's no importance whatsoever to the sex-gender discussion to me. This is much more something for the historian of science or the history of ID, and absolutely not a political program. It only grows more and more intricate, and this distinction between soul, body, etc., as brain and mind and hormones are more or less disconnected or connected along new lines according to ever-evolving theories, as sex and gender roles become more and more fluid in social life, as feminist and libertarian viewpoints tend to prevail in some countries, not in others, along with the relative stigmatization of homosexuality, etc., etc. And all my history of transsexualism was to show how this initial paradox of the man and the soul was being transformed by the progress in surgery, by the birth by the, the, the rise of feminism, by the destigmatization of homosexuality, by new laws, by new contexts, and so on and so forth. And uh, that it was just a change uh, with all these categories, which was reframing framing and reframing uh, transsexualism into transgenderism, queer, and so on and so forth. And I suddenly realized that I could no longer be, as I clearly was at the beginning of that project, the staunch Lacanian psychoanalyst who thought that the key issue with classical transsexualism was only a problem with the signifiers of sexual difference. Of course, it so happens that Lacan was both the first psychoanalyst to, first, uh, to attempt to psychoanalyze a TS patient 
His name was Henri. I could not find the story of his life. He, he tried to psychoanalyze Henri between 1952 and 1954, but I could not find who the man was and what happened to him, uh, uh, digging in the archives. And, and I know people who know who he was, but they never accepted to tell me his name. And not only that, but Lacan was also the first to introduce in French the word transsexualism, or more exactly, transsexualization. And he made such a process, transsexualization, the central issue of his new theory of psychosis in the 50s, with his famous rereading of the Schreber case. So I don't know how it is translated in English, but when you read it in French, that's in a new theory about psychosis, which is a rereading of the Schreber case, which established Lacan as a both, it's a very important, both as a key psychiatrist and the key psychoanalyst in France of the 50s. The word transsexualization is, appears for the, for the first time. Just, just a word about the Schreber case for people who have not read it. <coughs> President Schreber was a German um, judge <coughs> who uh, uh, experienced uh, uh, an outbreak of psychosis in his mid-40s. And uh, the, the most known feature of this psychosis is that he developed a delusion that he was a woman, not exactly uh, an ordinary woman. The woman uh, which was lacking to God to redeem mankind. Uh, which is, of course, not exactly what you would call transsexualism, okay? But the idea in which it was trained is that you could get rid of all these uh, objective paranoid delusions, reduce it to the core of the transsexualization progress, uh, process, and say that transsexuals we were meeting were pure crystalline instances of the Schreber's process of transsexualization. Uh, transsexualization in Lacan goes hand in hand with another very interesting process, which is called the death of the subject. And you have this very strong hypothesis that at, in any psychotic outbreak, the onset of any psych paranoid psychosis, you must have the two. A feeling of not knowing whether you are dead or alive, and a feeling of not knowing whether you are a man or a woman, and that the two are closely interlocked. And for example, when we examine patients in the hospital and so on and so forth, and we try to go back with them to the first instance, the, the onset of their uh, psychotic uh, uh, delusions or condition, that's still something that we are looking for. The feelings of you just do not know whether you are dead or alive. And you know, it's, it's not whether reality has changed. No, no, it's something which is radically subjective. Are you dead or alive? Or whether you still know whether you're a man or a woman. And, and sometimes you can very finely spot these, uh, these, these things. The problem is that as soon as I realized that I had written a history, a social history, of the transformation of the grammatical and cultural and categorical transformations of sex and gender, surgeries, uh, feelings, and so on and so forth, I could not any longer stick to my psychopathological framework because it was just part of the story, one period of the story, and not, you know, the, 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 the key to the entrance into the, the, the whole story. Of all these people maneuvering through the pitfalls of their existence and resorting to all kinds of reasons, aesthetic ones, political ones, to some kind of partial or complete sex or gender change and who were gradually replacing the classical transsexuals from the 50s. So in the last moment of this lecture, we'll briefly sketch what I did next, 
when I dropped the topic of sex and gender change issues. And then I show why I, uh, I was asked recently to, to give my opinion uh, for the French Parliament and to the Ethics Committee about the issue and what I said. I became more and more interested in the development, both moral and political, of the ideas of autonomy and reflexivity in Western modernity. But still, I'm working in a way where, in such that I try to see them through the prism of a clinical reading of intimate disorders and sufferings in that individual experience. That individual experience, caught as they are, in the slow process that makes them conform to these ideals, which are so typical of modern individualism. To put it in a nutshell, I went from scrutinizing a spectacular situation, sex or gender reassignment, which is certainly paradigmatic, but involves only a small number of individuals, to studying obsessions and scruples, which are infinitely more widespread disorders and troubles, but which give a very rich sociological and historical insight into what Norbert Elias called Selbstwang. Selbstwang is not an easy word to translate. Selbstwang means both the constraint to be a self and nothing else than a self, and also the self-constraint to conform to the social ideal of the individual. It refers both to the social and impersonal constraint to be, in the Western world, a conscientious self, and, on the other hand, to the multiple forms of lived, of experienced self-constraint, of self-reproach, of guilt, of perfectionist anxieties, which constitutes the process through which this impersonal requirement of Selbstwang manifests itself in the personal subjective experience and moral practices of individuals. Self-constraint, so understood, constitutes the other side and maybe the dark side or the complementary structure of autonomy. You can follow the rules you uh, fixed for yourself if you can comply with the rule you fixed for yourself. If you can obey to yourself, you can, if you can follow what you decided to follow. And to that extent, it shows the heavy cost we sometimes pay in psychological terms for being trustworthy, self-controlled individuals. From that point of view, in my book on obsessions, uh, you can understand the emergence of Freudian obsessive neurosis, neurosis and its transformation in obsessive compulsive disorders, the contemporary OCD in, of modern psychopathology, as important manifestation of the Eliasian civilization process, <coughs> which animates the society of individuals in the West. Why? Because scrupulosity, checking and checking and checking again, uh, self-control, the domination of one impulses, and so on and so forth, dangerously look like normal and even idealized states of mind, in a social, cultural, and religious form of life in which ideally this on all legitimate, legitimate moral restraint should come from within. So it's that, this is the, 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 the building block of Western interiority. In these two books, which are so difficult, the title which is difficult to translate in English, it's supposed to be beautiful in French, in English it's just gibberish. Scrupulous souls, lives of anguish, miserable obsessions. I retrace the history of this moral and psychological predicament from the 17th century to the invention by Freud of the Zwangsneurose, the obsessional neurosis. And in the end of the Guilty, the second volume, I retrace the transformation of the psychoanalytic obsessional neurosis into contemporary OCD. 
But the main thread of this history, as Avia told you uh, earlier, is the transformation of the ideals of individual autonomy. That is, the Eliasian process of individualization from reformation and counter-reformation to the present. That's why historians of psychiatry do not like what I do, because I'm doing history, not history of science or psychiatry. And to me, history of science and history of psychiatry is part of history. It can't be a sort of subfield of specialty, totally disconnected. You, know, you just can't do history of psychiatry if you disconnect it from what you know, the psychiatrists were reading and the kind of novels they were reading, the way people were saying hello, what they were eating, the political forms, institutions. So history tends to be global. And the history of psychiatry is usually you know, a, a petty description of local practices uh, following, you know, uh, very petty threads and completely disconnected from the rest of the history. It's very striking to, to, see, uh, to, to see that. It's the same with the history of physics or whatever, but in the history of psychiatry, you would expect that people are interested in global history, in the transformation of people. They are not. The hypothesis I followed is that each new normative requirement for a greater autonomy and self-control of individual, each requirement, be it of spiritual, moral, or psychological, psychological nature, entails new possibilities for mental suffering. At each phase of their development, individualistic societies must create specific institutions, categories, and forms of healing to address what? To address the excesses of the very self-constraint they impose upon everybody in order to empower everyone as autonomous subjects. So they created the disorder of scruples in the 17th century, Melanch forms of melancholia in the Romantic period, phobias and obsessions at the end of the 19th century, zwangsneurose and with psychoanalysis, and then OCD, in con the contemporary period. And at each time, it is not, as the historians of, historians of psychiatry say, it is not at all because there is a kind of scientific progress of clinical insight, which is better and better. It's because the requirement about the self tongue, the constraint to be oneself, self control, the way self control, uh, self critique, and so on and so on must be exercised, are changing within very different political, cultural, and religious framework. And the modification both of the symptoms and the therapies follows, in my grand hypothesis, follows this transformation of autonomy in the West. From this wider perspective, transsexualism, transgenderism, queer sexualities, and the like, appear in a new light. For the one constant of all these conditions is a kind of mantra. One thing which is absolutely constant in all these conditions. Why do I want to change sex or gender or whatever? Because I want to become myself. So sex change or gender change are all in the service of self-restoration. And this self-restoration can be subjectively lived and experienced only because it is a shared and perfectly understandable ideal in our type of society. What, of course, is, is extremely puzzling and counterintuitive is that such a social ideal, becoming oneself, can be so powerful that it helps and sustains people in the process of reconstructing their body so that their new body better coincides with what they expect from themselves. I'm fully aware that this is very vague. On the one hand, it only suggests how serious are our ideas of the self in their social and historical contexts, if they can support and even secure the success of such dramatic changes as surgical sex or gender changes how serious it is, this idea of the self. 
And on the other hand, it is maybe a way to come to terms with two paradoxes of sex and gender changes in our societies. The first one is the following. It is related to the moral panic of all those who fear that letting people choose their sex or gender can only lead to a deep dissolution of basic social bonds. The fact of the matter is only that it is plainly false. It never dissolved anything, it brought no revolution whatsoever. Becoming oneself is, on the contrary, a taxing endeavor. And people who undergo sex or gender change surgery seldom show anything like a delusional neglect of the others around them. On the contrary, it is always a painful history of adjustments and negotiations. Far from being an unequivocal, an unequivocal symptom of psychosis, that is, of desocialization, it is rather a tribute paid to our common religion of the self and a form of recovery. From a psychological or metaphysical point of view, the one I held 20 years ago. Uh, it's a self-diagnosed condition. It is self-prescribed and self-evaluated cure. All this looks like a logical absurdity. But from a historical and sociological point of view, at least in contemporary individu individualistic societies, no more. No more. There is no problem. It may look like an, a logic, logical absurdity, but it fits perfectly well with our idea of the self, of our right, of our, uh, what we are as individuals, and so on and so forth. The second paradox, which did not contribute to make me lots of friends, I didn't have any, any case in the TG community, uh, is that, in my view, the subversive potential of these practices, even in the most radical queer versions, is greatly exaggerated. On the contrary, they admirably fit into the liberal, individualistic framework of our everyday lives. And even if the legalization of sex change procedures was certainly hard to win, final victory was clear from the start. From the start. And as long as sex or gender change does not change anything to our ID or to our practices, of the self, as spectacular it may seem, it will not herald a substantial alteration of our sociability. On the contrary, it will remain confined to the aesthetic or to the purely moral. Toda. But the issue is that individualistic societies face, all face uh, a problem. Because, uh, uh, and it's, in France, we are very sensitive to this because uh, uh, our philosophical, moral, and political culture is deeply opposed to the American ones and to the institution of the self. Self as an institution, you know, with self-reliance, the self-made man, and uh, all that. Uh, to us, the self is something like, you know, it's an atom, and it's something which is isolated, and there is a, a regular confusion between individualism and egoism. It's 
It's very difficult for French people to understand that individualism is a form of sympathy. What we like in other people, in an individualistic society, is that they are autonomous, they are free. We want our children to be autonomous, for example, things like that. It's a form of sympathy, not a form of egoism and, and desocialization. There is probably something in the French turn of mind which is very, it's, uh, there is a problem with this. So. so when you say we are tolerant, it's not exactly that we are tolerant. We are heavily intolerant but uh, to, to that type of things. But our values, the structure, the, the norms, the values we, we, we follow um, are, are rather in, in the direction of these letting people self-asserting who they are. I, I'm, I do not say that it's easy. I think it's always a tension because, I mean, detraditionalization de is a process. It's the very process of individualistic societies. So there, are, there is always an enormous resistance to that process. So we should not confuse the fact that, is, statistically speaking, it's more and more accepted. And the value in the background, the value is that there is an autonomization progress, process which tends to, to favor that type of, 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 uh, of behavior. But these are more norms than, than facts, of course, of course. Mm. I just have one direct uh, question that, uh, with which I want to engage your la almost your very last uh, remark in your talk, and that is your reference to the victory of the transsexual turn as being clear from the start. And I wonder if you mean by that clear from the start because it takes place within a liberal gestalt and a liberal uh, uh, ideology. And if that's the case, Tell us what's the future of transsexuality now that we can see the end of liberalism on the horizon. Uh, I, just, so I, I forgot my crystal ball in Paris, unfortunately. Or the, the way that my crystal ball. Uh, the way we're busy thinking about post-liberalism, the end of the liberal order, which is much as is much as the European uh, cliche today as anywhere else. I don't think he wants a prophecy. He wants a. I don't want a, a, a Gedanken experiment. Well, the, the problem is that the, the, the so-called collapse of liberal values, to me, what I see is just a regress to pre-liberal values, that is to conservative, nationalistic, holistic, uh, ethnic values, okay? Even in France, huh, it's very, you can see that. And of course, to family values and to uh, traditional sex roles. So what I can see is the regress. The transformation, I just do not know. But the regress is very clear. But in other words, the victory might not be a clear cut. As you no, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a victory in the sense that they're very proud to have uh, the, the, this decision of, the, of 1992, which condemned the French government because French law did not allow a change of civil status from male to female for example. Uh, it appeared as a major victory. But you just see the, who, who were the judges at the European court. They were either, uh, one of them was a transsexual, first of all. Yes, the, 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 one of them started his legal career as a woman and, and was sitting as a man in the European court who was uh, supposed to, <laughs> to judge the, the, the French case at, at that time. It was the, the judge from the Netherlands. And you had people, on, very few people, with the law system compatible with the French system. It was, it was an, only the common law. Actually, I don't know what it is in Israel. It's a, uh, it's a kind of common law? It's a British. Yeah, British and Turkish. It's a, okay. 
British and Turkey. Oh, it's okay, so I don't know how it works. But in, for these people, there was absolutely no problem. I mean, as long as there is a right to privacy, there is a right to be left alone. And you have the, all the habeas corpus and, uh, in, in the background. So the French law preventing people from doing whatever they wish to their body as long as it was not a problem for other people was just unthinkable to them. But there we go. Allow them anywhere to say, go to a doctor and ask him to amputate your arm? The arm? No. <laughs> yes, but Why? it says. Why not? I feel the, the, the question was uh, the question was raised. Not only the question was raised, but people can ask to surgeons to remove their legs because they feel their leg is not theirs. Right. It's a, it's a, and this is not called a political fight. It's called a psychiatric disorder. But if it is your genitals, it is not a psychiatric disorder. It is a right. So the issue was raised that why people who feel that you know their legs do not belong to them and it, they can do they can take extreme measures you know you you see people putting their legs on the railway stations to have their legs cut by the train okay uh, because they feel that their legs are not their legs that they are just parasites limbs you know uh, on their body okay uh, the, the, the 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 issue was the issue was raised it's very rare but it happens strikes me is the, is the, the re-emergence of the body as the locus of identity, because in some ways you could say, and, and, and the, the shifts in that, because some transgender ideas are that it's no longer important. I don't have to get rid of my genitals, I can be whatever I want, and decide it in any way. But in the first stages, quite often it was who I am, in a sense, depends on, on how my body is. And how my body is, not in anything that I could do to my body, but I have to take radical, radical means in order to reshape my body. And quite often, in, in almost any other thing, that, that's why I asked the question about, about hands. And any other thing, the idea that you can reshape your body except in minor ways, say, for cosmetic reasons, or aesthetic surgeries, uh, was, was seen as something that always indicates a psychological problem. You can't want to get rid of your legs. You can't get, want to get rid of your right arm. And you can't actually want to try and, say, scar yourself. You can do tattoos because that's acceptable. Uh, and, and in some ways, how did that become? How did that become acceptable? Anyway, uh, I have no definite answers to that. But in my view, there is one word which changed a lot. It's when people started to speak not about transsexualism but about transsexuality. As a sort of sexuality, which was not homosexuality, which was not heterosexuality, but transsexuality. The idea being that you, you, you find a new word, a new category, in which you can lodge, so to speak, identity problems without necessarily having to uh, uh, attach to the integrity of the body or uh, uh, Asking to the mind more than when you ask to human mind, saying that you can you can be homosexual or heterosexual with the same brain, with the same. Not saying that you're free, okay, but just saying that it's just an, an option of of, of the, the normal functioning of, of of people to be homosexual or uh, or heterosexual. You just add transsexual, in, not in the sense of a medical condition, but a type of sexuality. So what is very striking to me is the creativity. The, the queer activists are, are incredibly creative in terms of vocabulary, body practices, all these things. Okay. It's this creativity which helps to change the problem and to, uh, 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 to end, I would say, the, the, uh, the, the ethical, the medical ethical problem of, of, of operating and hormoning people. Okay, be, because they found some ways of negotiating, uh, creating new categories for, 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 for that. It's not the only 
key word, but many inventions of that type help to uh, not to dissolve, but to, to, to reframe the, 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 the problem in, in other categories. With the, it only works, of course, in societies in which there is not a big stigma against homosexuality, of course. Uh, you just can't do that in Iran, of course. Yeah. in the future, in the next 10, 20 years, that people that regret it will politically start talking, raising this issue. They are. And fracturing the idea. They that are. That they are. They are. And, and, and the forerunners of that are the intersex. The, inter the, the people who have a medical condition, a genetic condition, they are born with, you know, uh, uh, genital organs of the two sexes. Uh, hermaphroditism is, was the, the, the old word for that. And many of them are suing uh, endocrinologists and surgeons because as when they were babies, they were operated only for, for, for the sake of a sort of you know, anatomic conformity of ideals of, uh, of uh, regulating bodies and things like that. And many of them, they just realize that uh, when they are 20 year old, that they can't have children and that actually most of their they look like women, for example, but all their cells are XY, for example. So it creates a major problem. And they just realize that they, everybody lied to them since they were born. So there is, uh, uh, there is a, a template uh, for uh, suing uh, psychiatrists and, uh, and endocrinologists and surgeons who much too easily accepted Transsexual like like discussion now in Israel or in other countries about circumcision, like making a decision about your body as a baby is something that is discussed already. I'm asking about something which seems very obvious in today's uh, zeitgeist that an adult can make a decision about his body, especially about his sexual organs. Can you imagine in 10, 20 years a an opposite discussion of, of people that like the people that you have uh, treated saying, hey, 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 this was a mistake, and starting a, a, a discussion whether this. Uh, there is a, my, answer, my answer is very is strongly biased because uh, uh, people I see, I still see, it's just very limited. Because I, as a scholar, I just can't take people in analysis. I, I just, uh, it's just not possible. So I have just a very one third of my time for that, and I'm not a very experienced analyst at all. But those, uh, I, I met people who. who, who consulted me because they, they had gone through such a, such a, a problem. Right? They, they are regretting and they are saying that uh, it was quite crazy, you know, I saw a, a shrink three times and then I had the paper for the hormones and then uh, I was operated well, six months they later. So they the operation. No, the, now now they, back because they feel it's a mutilation. And that they were so depressed and uh, they would have uh, done anything to get out of their depression and their, their, their feelings and so on and so forth. And that uh, uh, it was much too easy. 20 years ago, it was hell to get hormone and surgery. I mean, you, you, people were threatening to commit suicide. It, it would take years. Uh, it was very, very few surgeons would accept to do that. Now, it's an industry. Concept of life. If, if it can only be either a man or a woman, or this idea of woman is connected also to your question. You ask 
uh, why all of a sudden did they regret? Because they had only one option. Then they couldn't, uh, they had this one option, they can be either this or this, and now they're not satisfied of the one option that they had. So the, so this kind of dissatisfaction and wanted to, wanting to commit suicide or, or to go to death, that makes me think about the idea of, uh, uh, for example, the death drive of Lacan. When he speaks of uh, the death drive, it's very different from the Freudian concept of the death drive in this manner that, um, I will go to my question actually. <laughs> I, want, I, will, I, have, I was having a lot of thought while you were talking, but uh, I wanted to ask if you thought, like, when you talked about also uh, in the end about the transformation of the self and all that, then now that there is only also one option to transform the self into being from one thing to another thing, like the concept of revolution. But, but if you think about this from the perspective of death, then actually this person that wanted to commit suicide, he got an option to change his whole way to think about life. Then my question is, why is that not happening? Do you, do you understand my question? In a way, the case of this guy, yeah. who, who was utterly psychotic, there was, there was no doubt uh, okay. about that. Okay. Mm. Uh, it was a case of uh, forced feminization. He was raised as a, as a woman by his mother in hate of men and the hate of his own father. So he was dressed, he was, a, it was quite a crazy, uh, a very crazy story. But he was, uh, I mean, uh, socially speaking, a perfectly adapted person. I mean, he was a very, he was a very brilliant, uh, friend. he's a very brilliant French businessman. And the point is that it, it shows the connection between Lacan calls, what Lacan calls transsexualization and the death of the subject. Because it's a way of committing suicide in one sex mm -hmm. to live in the other. Yeah, to live in the other. Okay. It's, it's, you can see the crossing. Okay. Because as soon as he could not find an issue in terms of transsexualization, he was just... Uh, But it's, it's, it's a nice thing to think that you can escape binary divisions as if they were ideological terms. But when you are caught by your language, by your, the grammar of your language, it's, it's, it's just not something you can, uh, you can... It's just not like changing your religion, you know. It's just not a conversion of that type. I mean, you're taken uh, and caught, I would say, in, in the process in terms that are, are, are quite it's little. Not because I think it's easy to do so, but I, must, I think it's a, it's a power mechanism, right? This idea of gender and the, the, the concept that you cannot... Explain. They don't make things more easy, that's for sure. But we're, what we are talking about is just... Is, is this man was on the top of uh, the... So, I mean, he was uh, immensely wealthy. So <laughs> I shouldn't talk too much about that. Okay, so the person was a very wealthy person. Okay, he, was, he had everything he could he could have. He was desperately, you know. and the solution he found, he had found actually, was through uh, sadomasochism, ritualized sadomasochism, okay. and uh, it, it ended up like that. He offered me to be his master. And I say, no, you're cured. <laughs> Uh, 
psychoanalytic point of view of uh, showing these uh, factors of uh, uh, causing these issues uh, in contrast to psychoclinic. Uh, maybe I'm not so, <laughs> I don't also use the terms uh, correctly because I don't see completely the uh, difference as uh, um, I wish. So, thank you. The, the problem is when I, I wrote uh, the book, uh, The Metamorphose Impensable, I'd also written an extensive description of uh, 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 psychoanalysis with a transsexual patient. It is impossible to publish this. This is as if I was giving, him, giving you his uh, cell phone number. It's just, I mean, if you describe what must be described, there is no confidentiality possible. Because I always try to do that in, in my books on... Uh, on uh, obsessional neurosis, I, I, I give the complete description of a psychoanalytic therapy of an obsessive compulsive disorder. It's a hundred page long and it's very detailed. I, can't, I could not do that with transsexuals, especially in France, because they all knew each other. And that most uh, physicians would recognize very easily the case. Okay. And so, uh, what is so subjective in these issues of why X wants to change his sex and Y wants to change his sex and the difference between being it's a, transsexualism is, is a homogenizing category I think it is very different from the M to F and for uh, F to M very very different Sex is not that kind of limit, you know, that you can cross in either sense, in, in either di direction. It's some, sex is very different for each sex, for example. And even more, the stories of the, 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 of the individuals are, are very big. And that's the problem. That's also the reason why I dropped that. Because if you want to, ex to answer, your question is the real question. But if you want to answer the question, you have to say things that are not possible. You cannot publish things like that. You cannot explain uh, the, the details. So I, I did it for my colleagues. And uh, in some cases, uh, in some places, in hospitals, when there is confidentiality, I can explain what happens. But it can't go uh, much further than what I said about the man who, well, who had this uh, Incredible pain when uh, in his orgasm, for example. So I, I can, it's, it's a very spectacular. Nobody can know that. It's impossible to recognize. So I can say things like that. But it's very abstract, and you don't have all the story of his life, and so you don't understand why and how he solved this problem getting into this cycle. And the, the, the real interest of it is to would be to show that out. I think Kondus is, is asking. You've told us why, well, you've given us a, a social look at this, a social anthropological look at this, and, and you said things about why this has become acceptable, why certain ways of uh, expression have become common. But uh, so she asks, now as a psychoanalyst, what would you say, because we don't owe no Well, I can say something very simple. It starts before you're born. So you think it is biological? It's not biological. It starts in your parents' fantasy. Yes, it starts in your parents' fantasy. And uh, it is uh, why it is very difficult to, uh, to, to take care of it. I mean, the, the people I met, the people I met. Okay, thank you very much.